very excited to have a dear friend, a role model, and a woman entrepreneur, Pooja Goel, who wears many hats. She's a serial entrepreneur with a successful exit track record and a global professional. Over 20 years of experience working in different types of organizations, including tech companies, VC funds, and in the recent past, in a tech uh, industry. I'm so excited to have you, Pooja, and thank you for doing this interview. Thank you, Sarika. Excited to be talking to you. Um, yeah, our friendship goes a long way. Yes, we both started the entrepreneurial journey more or less at the same time. So Pooja, before we even start this uh, uh, interview process, um, I would like to ask you one particular question. Uh, you have not only moved cities, you have moved continents. And I would like to understand what do you think added as a value of moving different countries and cities as a professional, as an entrepreneur in your journey? What were those factors which helped you to take up some of the challenges as an entrepreneur, as a professional by moving these countries and cities? Um, so Sarika, I think as an individual, I get bored very easily. I need change um, a lot. And, um, and it took me a while to understand uh, that whole idea of strength of a weakness. It is a strength, but it could also be a weakness. But to your question about exploration and, you know, changing continents, changing cities, um, I think that is, um, I can only see virtues there. Uh, while, you know, it can be, there can be a sense of insecurity. There can be a sense of um, kind of, um, uh, loss where, you know, you feel like you are in an uncomfortable situation again, but the advantage is that, um, you have to make an effort each time to slightly reinvent yourself, uh, invest in your friend circle, there, people who support you there. And in the process, you end up making new relationships, uh, getting new learnings. Um, I, I really believe that, you know, having worked in the Bay Area and in, um, and in France and the U S and, um, and, and the UK, it really gives you a perspective on, you know, how people think and how, on so many vectors, people think in, in a similar way, whichever culture you might come from, um, the, uh, the packaging might be different, but uh, but but there is a similarity to the, and you can connect to people across culture. You know, coming back to this journey, which you spoke about, which surpassed different continents from professional, corporate professional to an entrepreneur, and now to even, I would say a serial entrepreneur. And of course, as a working mom, um, what are the three factors you would attribute your success to? I would say, one is just staying in the arena as a, as a woman with you know competing priorities at different stages of life that can be hard and also social kind of stereotypes around it so just staying in the arena and you know while i might not think of myself as the smartest person in the room the biggest problem solver the greatest communicator but i know i will be the last person standing the second thing is the uh, the ability or the need to zoom in and zoom out. Uh, I trained as an engineer. So, uh, you know, you kind of treat life also as an engineering problem that there is one solution to to this to this life where, you know, OK, you graduate from undergrad and take up a good job with a consulting firm and then work for few years and then go do your MBA and then, you know, take up a bigger job uh, and in the meantime, get married and have two kids. So you have this notion that it is an engineering, there's one answer to life and it's going to be a linear path by and large. Uh, but the truth is that, uh, you know, if you zoom out a little bit, you realize that it is it is not an engineering problem, it's a design problem. And there are 
multiple life paths that you can take. So I think um, those are the two or three things that have that have helped. One is just just being at it. Um, you know, um, there is no substitute to kind of hard work uh, and perseverance. Second is the ability to zoom in and zoom out and kind of thinking of just just your journey um, as as kind of a design problem rather than an engineering problem. And um, and and the third thing is having some deep special relationships, family, friends who are um, who act as rocks and anchors for you because you know especially when you are an entrepreneur it's a lonely journey it just so many things it's i call it like the journey of micro failures while on you know linkedin and on twitter you will see oh you got this award and you you know you got selected and you got funding but behind the scenes every entrepreneur is struggling with you know cash flow and fundraising and market all of those because you're starting from scratch right so so at the time, if you have some strong relationships who are always there to kind of who have your back, um, that is a big uh, that is a big uh, uh, factor to helping you accomplish what you started out to do. Fantastic. Um, you know, Pooja, uh, as a woman, we have all faced challenges sometime or the other whether as a child, some stereotypes you would have seen or at, as a professional and even as an entrepreneur, you rightly said entrepreneur is a very lonely journey. What were some of those challenges or I would say stereotypes probably you faced in your journey and um, or, or you saw something very disturbing around you in your circle, uh, which possibly could have been avoided if that person would not have been a woman. So in terms of um stereotypes i think um personally i i have not kind of uh, experienced it or chose to disregard it actively um you know we and for most of the part because possibly i didn't even have the vocabulary for it or you know my mental framework was um you do good work it is a meritocratic system and you do good work you'll be recognized i don't think anybody is sitting there judging you and saying we will make a decision based on your agenda so that was the general mental framework i went into most situations but as my children started to grow my daughters started to grow i from a distance started to see these issues so my daughter she older one she's interested in computer science and coding and uh, she was trying to make a call in her uh, 11th grade to take computer science, SL, standard level or higher level. She wanted to take higher level, but she decided to uh, take uh, SL. And in fact, she was thinking of letting it go completely because she said there were only uh, two other girls who were taking computer science. And she felt intimidated because the other boys in the cohort had done, had won hackathons, had, uh, you know, uh, the youngest one, the, the one of them was the uh, youngest ethical hacker in the world. Uh, you know, they had taken part, they had participated in many competitions. So she was very intimidated with that idea. And, and that's when it, occurred to me that you know the same problem where i found myself with 13 girls in a class of 500 students it just continues to be the same and if we are talking about the pipeline issue we don't fix this pipeline uh, at a starting level how are we going to kind of uh, get to that stage of decision makers at women a more gender balanced decision making ecosystem what I have found is when you are the lone voice, the level at which you are conscious is very high. When you get to two, you begin to talk to each other, but you're also always competing for attention and projects and so on. But when it comes to three women in a, in a room, uh, something magical begins to happen. The camaraderie begins to take shape. You begin to share a lot of 
these things and the um, the culture begins to get impacted. So I've always believed in the power of three and uh, there is some research around it where kind of this 33% or one third is the magical number uh, where minorities begin to feel more at home um, in these uh, in, 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 in environments like high stress environments, decision making environments. And thank you so much for that Pooja. Uh, for me, the biggest takeaway is that how when we see our next generation facing the same challenges which we faced, that there is a wake up reality call. And uh, we feel that we need to do something about it. And the second piece was how you have disregarded it in your own journey, but you would like to now start paying it forward so that the next generation doesn't go through it. And of course, the power of three, as they say, not being the lone voice, but and not bringing the second voice, but actually bringing more than three voices and making it actually a, a quorum within a forum, as I would call it. Now, this is this is wonderful. You know, uh, Pooja, I would like to ask one more question to you. And you spoke about challenge network and we were speaking about it before the interview too. You spoke about a support network, which is your strong family, friends, partners. Um, but then you spoke about challenge network. Would you like to, you know, expand a bit more on that? You know, we have these close friendships and like people, who, most of us have those close friendships, family bonds where, uh, where they will, they believe in you and they are there to support you. Uh, and and they want to see you happy and and that is your support network uh, you need to vent out you go to them and uh, and and clarify your thoughts all of that happens with that support network and you feel like they have your back but i've found that it's also important to actively cultivate a challenge network who are uh, who who want to see you successful, not just happy, who kind of believe in you, but they also kind of say you could do more, you know, and it is, it is in the big things and the small things. So um, as, as we take some of these important life decisions, career decisions, um, and even during the course of our, um, professional journeys we make decisions about taking up a particular role taking a plunge taking money from a particular investor especially as women we sometimes tend to hold ourselves back and say oh maybe i'm not ready for it or um maybe uh, you know i should wait a while and that's where the challenge network really helps you these are the mentors uh, these could be friends who will kind of uh, call you out on it and say look i mean go ahead do it i mean you are you are you aiming too low shouldn't you be aiming a little high shouldn't you be thinking about it this way uh, why are you comparing yourself to this or competing against this think global think big and that that challenge uh, helps you grow as a professional, be it, whether it's an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, or as a corporate professional. So Pooja, my next question would be actually focused on your uh, current career path, specifically in the ed tech. What do you see in this industry as a journey? What do you see the um, next big change coming in with the emerging technologies coming in what are the biggest next three changes which you see uh, happening in this industry in the edtech space you know edtech is is ripe for disruption and has been ripe for disruption over the last two decades this is one sector in which pretty much every un every stakeholder is unhappy and dissatisfied so if you look at the user which is the child they have moved on in terms of how they use technology, how they study, how they learn, how they solve problems. You know, they are using technology day in and day out. They're digital natives. They think of uh, their cell phones as their extension, body extension, right? Um, as far as our, uh, the 
the parents are unhappy you talk to any parent of a school going kid they are unhappy with you know what is being taught in school and there is a, absolutely a mismatch between expectations that we have of schools and what they are able to fulfill we just put everything in the school that you know you are supposed to prepare them for the job as well and also give them the value system and also give them the food and transportation we just we want the school to take on everything so there might be but but parents are unhappy teachers are extremely overworked and unhappy so most of the stakeholders in the system are it, it doesn't work for them so something is terribly wrong and what we have seen is with most industries uh, they have evolved to have customer at the center of their solution now in a in in education because it has been so centralized much like you know you could say media being centralized you know jab doordarshan was the only thing um education has been centralized government sets the policies um and and decides on the uh, the the curriculum framework the boards do that what that has done is it has been created to meet the needs of everybody else but the child so child is not at the center of the education system we are not thinking ki this is how we need to uh, we need to understand the child this is what each child needs while technology exists to enable that while the infrastructure exists to enable that so i think if there is one big shift that is happening and needs to happen is that from this institution being at the center of the education system the child who's the customer the user uh, who who the whose outcomes will matter the most will come to be at the center of this education system so the second big shift that i see is we will begin as technology penetrates the schooling system whether in k through 12 or higher ed um there is a lot of personalization that will come become the heart of the education system where you know each child learns differently they will they have different goals um their strengths are different weaknesses are different and might need many different kinds of um uh, approaches to learning and the third thing is you know this shift this 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 whole idea of 12 14 years of k through 12 school and four years of college and then you know going to work and then retire is a completely outdated one also it's a very recent one it's only been developed in the last 100 years so i think that shift is going to happen where each one of us will have almost 50 60 years of working life uh, especially our next generation and therefore the education system will need to evolve to take care of that versus saying okay you know we have put everything in it's like putting the putting the operating system in the hardware once and saying okay now you are good to go for the next 40 years you can keep using it without any updates without any changes without any evolution there so i think that is the third big shift we'll see is that the timing the baby structure the education learn as you earn and earn as you learn um so those are the three big shifts i see you know moving from being very centralized to being decentralized and democratized second is the use of data to have personalization for children that being the heart and the third is that education is a uh, or a learning is a lifelong priority and needs to be interspersed through our working life and so you know this whole concept of learn as you earn and earn as you learn is uh, is going to become more mainstream thank you so much this lifelong learning is a i'm a biggest proponent of that one of the last questions pooja before we sign off as a serial entrepreneur and a woman in tech um how would you what would you advise uh the young women or even the women at our age they keep themselves relevant and keep upgrading themselves with different skills and competencies how what would you advise them 
So I would say three things. One is not every closed door is locked. Push. Anytime you ask for help, most people are available to support. But that uh, first step has to come from you. And in my career, I've like I've reached, I reach out to so many people. There is rarely this situation where a person will say, no, I'm not, I can't help you or I can't uh, divulge this or that. Most people are available to support you. So ask for help. The onus is on you to do that. Uh, second uh, thing that I would say is um, own your decisions. Um, you know, as you grow through your career and and life you it, it becomes leadership becomes a lot about making these decisions and as i said decisions are inherently risky so there is always this urge to say let someone else make the decision and for women traditionally that's been the case financial decisions are made by someone you know either the the father or the um or the husband uh, you know, even what you are going to do in your uh, studies or what discipline you are going to choose in your college, parents tend to decide for the girl. So it is very important that we gradually build the muscle of owning our decisions, big and uh, small. And lastly, I would say um, you can't think your way forward. You won't have you know, sitting in a room on an Excel spreadsheet, you won't have all the answers. So you can't think your way forward. You have to build your way forward. So as you make those decisions, it's not about getting it right all the time. But the idea is to test it out, to prototype it, and continue to build forward. Um, only then the clarity begins to emerge. Thank you so much, Pooja. I think this has been a wonderful um, discussion. For me, the three key takeaways have been, you know, that own your decisions and keep at it. The tenacity and the persistence pays off in the end. And the third is to build your support and challenge network. I love the challenge network concept. Um, the mentors, your sponsors, um, your colleagues, they happen to be your challenge network. And, you know, you need to make sure that you push your way ahead and make sure that all the doors which are not locked, you keep pushing them at it. But thank you so much, Pooja. Um, lovely to have you here and looking forward to many more such discussions in the future.